great to see you both. I'm so uh, appreciative of the little bit of the, the squeeze of the time. I of course, today. no, no, no. Thank you. No. We are appreciative. Jeez. Oh my gosh. So wait, do we have an Aussie and a South African, or what? What are the accents? No, we got two Sathers, <laughs> two South Africans. Good. Well picked up there. I'm really impressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm in, so in love with the accent, and every person I have met from from South Africa is just their sunshine. Uh, that's, wow, that's cool that's, to hear. And yeah. and you even pronounce South Africa correctly because most yeah. people say from America or somewhere say. South Africa and all South Africans say South Africa. <laughs> well, I lived in London for four years and I met so many South Africans and it was in the blend of the word, like South Africa. Like, like there, South you got it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You know, like, yeah, yeah. And it's nice. Hey guys. Hello. Oh, I look like such a geek. <laughs> Don't worry. You know what? No, you don't. That's so hot right now. <laughs> Pretty amazing, right? Exactly. How's that? Perfect. Oh, there epic. So yeah. much better. Oh, much better. Yeah. Like, I was like thinking, I know I'm getting old, but yes, I'm, and I'm getting deaf. But <laughs> today it's extra bad. It's funny. You, you and I start leaning into the computer screen, even yeah. though that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally. All right, yeah. we did this, humans. So, cool, so we just, I just wanted to just first double check is, is it pronounced uh, claude or cloud claude first claude. One. claude okay perfect because i've been saying like like whole the whole day i'm like claude cloud claude cloud <laughs> and then i had to, <laughs> then I had to ask uh, michael o'brien i was like buddy please can you tell me the right pronunciation <laughs> and it, then it's in, in america we say claude okay claude. But, every, but the name is really how you pronounce it claude okay. yeah okay that's the given name yeah Okay, cool okay. stuff, cool stuff. Um, <laughs> I love it. I'll do my best to, to eliminate some of the ums. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. We're, We're still practicing worry. after yeah. so many episodes. <laughs> we say ya yeah all the time and I things like that. Really <laughs> Amazing. Um, just one, one more thing if we... Waking... Cool stuff. Well... Good afternoon there, Claude Silva. Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast today. Amazing to be here. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Craig. Uh, it's our pleasure. So we were very kindly introduced to you by a previous guest of ours, uh, Michael O'Brien, and he speaks seriously highly of you. And he says hello, and he sends you a high five, and he's really looking forward to hearing this podcast. Oh, he's amazing. He gifted me with The Alchemist for my birthday two weeks ago. And I just, I just, I really like Michael a lot. So I feel like I'm in good company if I'm with uh, the two of you. That's cool. How, how did you actually meet book? Michael? I couldn't tell you right now. I have no <laughs> idea other than, you know, the universe just slides you great people when I think, you know, you're on some kind of frequency wanting to make this place make this life make this world just more tender more awake more alive and so michael somehow was slid to me by the universe and i am very thankful for that oh that's I love cool. this. yeah it's nice when those convergences happen and yeah it's uh, it's interesting like just wondering why they happen but they definitely happen for a reason and that's really cool um so so yeah just to kick it off you've had a very exciting two weeks these last two weeks you've had two big celebrations it's been your birthday and yesterday was your first mother's day as a mother so wow congratulations like how were those days for you thank you so much and in between that i had my five-year anniversary here oh wow awesome. cool so kind of crazy <laughs> big <laughs> oh, like in two weeks i had three massive celebrations and i feel i i just feel so grateful. I feel amazing. I feel very, um, very thankful. I cannot believe I'm a mom. It, oh, it's so exciting. And, uh, you know, here I am, rock me like a hurricane. Let's do this. You have a big love for music, eh? If we're not wrong. I really do. And it's random. It's super. Love random. it. So, yeah. Uh, I can't even think who sings the song, but it's, yeah, cool. it's so amazing. I always love it when, when you're around people that can 
just bring out a, a, a song line or, you know, and you always like, and then you, you challenge, this is the challenge. Okay. Who was it? Who, who sang that? You know, and it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> so Claude, your family was, was very academic and altruistic and very generous. Um, and, but academics was not really your thing as a, as a youngster. Maybe you can take us back to those early years and tell us a little bit, a little bit about your childhood. Yeah. So I was an athlete and a tomboy at a, a very early age. I can remember my dad teaching me how to throw a football and a baseball at around five. And I'm so grateful for that because I think hand-eye coordination has taken me far in life. And I'm excited that I can still throw a ball just like the best of them. <laughs> uh, but I was dyslexic. And my, my mom was an elementary school teacher. And the great thing is that she caught that really, really early. And so I went. And I had a lot of tutors throughout my entire academic life. I was very creative and a curious kid. Again, very athletic. And certain things just took me a little bit longer to grasp in terms of testing and those things that you're expected to do in school. Which, by the way, is why I ended up finding some incredible schools later on in life that didn't require the testing and were all about alternative and experiential education because that's how I learn and it's really visual and I need to get my hands dirty and which I, I love that about I love that about myself I didn't know that at an early age but um so you know I excelled at sports and I excelled at, at probably making friends I would think and when we were what I should say when I was 11 going on 12 we moved from New York City to Santa Fe New Mexico which for the rest of the world is like moving from the moon to Mars, I think. <laughs> New York City is a melting pot of, of human beings and tall buildings and noise. And even back then, you know, years and years ago, just a cacophony. And Santa Fe is just vistas and blue sky forever mm. and ever. You're 7,000 feet up in the air. The houses are adobe, they're brown, there are no skyscrapers. You can't build over three stories there because mm. they don't want you to block the incredible views and, and the mountains. Cool. And you know, cool. life really took on a different slant at that point. I, I went to a, um, a private school and was starting to excel in tennis, which is something that, tennis and soccer, I should say, which really carried me quite a far way. Made some great friends and and struggled, <laughs> I continued to struggle in school. <laughs> I was great with the liberal arts and humanities and history, but when it came to math, I just was terrible. In fact, I took algebra three different times. And I took, the last time I took algebra, I was a senior in high school, taking it with freshmen in high school. It was like, <laughs> I just felt like this, you know, <laughs> completely, which wasn't great for my self-esteem. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, we did this incredible thing at dinners. We would read poetry with my, my mom and dad, my brother. Wow. And that's what we would do. I mean, my, my parents are avid, avid artistic types of people. Um, they're humanitarians, I would say. They're very interested in the arts. They're art collectors. And they're, they're poets in their own right, you know, the way they go through life, I think. And I've never told them that, but I will. <laughs> so we would sit around the table and read poetry and kind of dissect poetry, which looking back on that now is amazing. And I can't wait to do that with Shalom. And I can also remember as a 14, 15 year old being like, oh God, I just did this all day in school. I <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> So, what so an amazing do, tradition though. Yeah, it's super amazing. Do, do you re recall any like favorite poets or poems? Well, I really got into E.E. E. Cummings at that time. Mm -hmm. My mom has a few master's degrees and one of them is in English Lit and she loves Old English. And so she would recite Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in Old mm -hmm. English. And I can remember just hearing wow. her. I can't do it, but I can remember her doing that. Um, my dad, Langston Hughes, I mean, he was probably more of a beat poet type of person. And yeah, I mean, Robert Frost, I mean, how can you not, how can you not know Robert Frost as, a, as an American, really? So, 
and I really liked the poetry of music. So Jim Morrison, who I think mm. was a poet, you know, that's poetry that I would recite. And mm. I was able to remember lyrics, as you just saw, mm. that I couldn't remember sequences of mathematics. <laughs> it's, so, it's so interesting. Yeah, it's so funny. Like, um, just everyone is so different, say, and we wired so differently. Like, you know, you can remember lines of music and poetry and probably like movie lines and stuff as well. And then, but maths, like there's no chance. And, and I'm the, probably the complete opposite. You give me a number or whatever, I'm like, oh, don't you worry. But you ask me for a movie line or someone's name or something, I'm like, no, I can't do it. <laughs> well, you learn, I think as a dyslexic, but I think as anyone, you, you learn how to survive and you learn how to, how to get beyond what is the limitation in front of you because either for peer pressure or you need to graduate or you need to, you know, you don't want to be left behind. And so I learned my skills of my winning, my ways of my ways to win in many ways. And I think a lot of that was via intuition and, and being extremely right brain. I had to learn how to be more left brain. I had to learn how to, think in uh, more of a critical, with more critical lens throughout mm. my life. So yeah, it's wild, man. <laughs> well, you, you know, you, you, that's why you've got this big smile and this warm energy if you're all right-brained and that's, uh, that's awesome. It's, it's interesting because I actually listened to a, a thing recently, I think it was a TED talk actually by Sir Ken Robinson and it's worth to, he, he talks about schooling and that's what you're talking about now and like how important creativity is actually in, in everything we do it's like how an art and poetry and and how we actually understand each other and how we how we actually navigate this world together and um it's actually really worth to for our listeners you know to, to check check his stuff out because it's it's fascinating it's not all just even the stem stuff you know even the sciences comes from a creative place so i think a lot of the schools and stuff uh, it's, it's so important to not um negate how important the creative arts are in just the fabric of of society i love that you said that and you know i'm thinking about the wall the wall that i'm looking at in my room and i do have a po i have a poem that's hanging there uh, one thing but you know i have these thank you cards everywhere on this wall and that in itself is a piece of art i mean that in itself is is really an ode, I think, in many ways to gratitude. And it's extremely humbling for me to look at all of the time and realize and recognize that these were sent to me. Mm. And someone mm. took the time to go to a store and purchase a thank you card and then hand write me a note. Mm. You know, it's really, it's very moving to me, I have to say. Yeah, I agree. There's something so cool about receiving handwritten things these days, isn't there? Like, you know, it's, it's just, it's that extra bit of effort. That's that just that 5%, even though it's more than 5%, you know what I mean? And it really stands out. It's a, uh, it's very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so just, you mentioned that, uh, you know, like you, you struggled a little bit at school and, and you, you failed your algebra exams. Um, I was just wondering, like, and then you obviously immersed yourself in sports and you're a super good tennis player. D what did your folks, like being academics, how did they kind of respond to you not, not necessarily enjoying it? Well, I, I think, it was, quite frankly, I think it, I was odd. I mean, I was, I, you know, I don't, I'm going to use the word black sheep because that's actually how I felt. Today, I wouldn't use that word, black sheep. I would never call myself a black sheep. I would call myself a late bloomer. And, mm -hmm. and a, you know, I have a unique style of learning and a unique style of taking in information. But back then, I was the black sheep. I was very aware of that. And I think I painted myself into that corner in a way, if you, th if you think about it. So mm -hmm. um, I think I was a, a curiosity in many ways to my parents. And they were they were patience it's not that they weren't they they had me with incredible tutors but you know the, the tutor will only get you so far you have to do the work and if if that's not the way you're programmed and that's not the way your mind is organized well you feel like you're striking out so i ended up taking that on in many ways as um you know lim a limiting belief that i just was dumb quite frankly mm. 
and so while I was excelling in sports and you know could memorize lyrics from The Cure or Joy Division or REM, yeah. I really, really, really had a hard time in, in school and in high school. And you know, was failing out of biology in my senior year and took the SATs three times, all on time. So that was really this dichotomy in many, many ways. And I was also, I was, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of friends. I mean, dare I say popular, I think that's that would be very braggy for me, but um, I've always been me. So, you know, I had a, some, some great energy and attracted some great energy. And yet, I really sucked at school. So I didn't, you know, when school was over and everyone goes off to college, I didn't leave myself many options. And I ended up getting into a school on a wait list. And that was the only option I had was to go to that college. And in retrospect, I never would have gone. But, hmm. like, and that's one thing I can say, like, did I learn anything there? Like, did I get to know myself in any way? No, I had a lot of pain there. So I, I could easily take that part of my life out and I would still think I'd be on this road, but um, that's just the way it went. I followed what I thought everyone does, which is you go straight to school. And in mm -hmm. retrospect, I needed to have stopped taking that year off then. And mm -hmm. I didn't. So what I did is after my sophomore year, that's when I took the time off. Huh. That's interesting. It's a, uh... I, I, I took that year off and I'm actually still on it right now. It's been, it's been 20 years. So my mom's still waiting for me to come home. I love it. I love it. I mean, you're not, what's that saying? You're never too old to have a happy childhood. I love it. It's actually mm. it's the first time I've heard that. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm. Hey, you're, never, you're never too old to have a happy childhood. I love that. Awesome. So, so you were... Um, actually a little bit experimental with drugs talking about when you were younger for a period and yeah, just before the, the time of, uh, before you sort of came clean at around 22, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that phase of your life. Yeah. I love that You know, my biography here. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. This morning I was making some coffee and I actually said out loud, I said, Oh man, if Shalom ever touches drugs, I'm going to cut her fingers off. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy because that is part of the, the finding yourself and experimentation and identification in adolescence you know, you're finding out who you are mm -hmm. so of course people go through that type of journey and I think you know I if, if we go back to what I said 10 minutes ago which is I ended up thinking I was dumb and so I painted that picture of me in this corner. You know, I took experimentation with drugs to an extreme because I, there's a part of me that I just didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that was a way for me to further not like myself when it got to be extreme. Of course, just experimenting and having fun. Like, I was great. Mm -hmm. I had a great time. <laughs> you know, it was awesome. Were you like, did you have like a group of friends that were, that was also involved? Like, how did you really get into it? <laughs> how did I find, <laughs> did I find, how did I find uh, some bad habits? Yeah. I mean, yes. I was, uh, I went to a private school and I was, um, uh, I was able to purchase what I wanted to purchase and, it's also in, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in a lot of ski towns or, or mountain towns, such as New Mexico, Santa Fe, they, you know, there's a lot of drugs there. And also we're close to the Mexican border and mm. so forth and so on. And so, you know, I did some incredibly stupid things later mm. on in my life, um, later on in that journey of my life. But it was something that I don't regret actually at all. And, and I, am here whereas i have friends that didn't make it you mm. know and i have friends I mean, that didn't stop when i stopped they they went on and on and on and you know my very 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 good friend took her life and mm. i have her tattoo her name tattooed on my foot and mm. friends many friends went to jail and you know they they went to an extreme i stopped way before that extreme would happen i knew in my i had limits for myself that I would, I set for myself. There were certain things I would never do. Mm. 
Wow. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating because like you say, you, you're sitting now with this big smile on your face and, and things are good. And, and you could argue that that phase of your life made you part of, you know, who you are now and who is an amazing person. And have your thoughts, you know, when you were thinking about the little one and, and you were like, she's never going to do drugs. <laughs> have, have, you know, in that moment, did, did something change? Did you kind of think, well, maybe it's okay to experiment or, or, or have you have your thoughts totally like sort of flipped on that then? You mean when I was saying that this morning? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like are you, you know, now that you're saying it out loud, I mean, you know, that is part of your life, but you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a good thing for one to experiment with one, oneself or is it better to just not open that door at all? No, I think it's good for, for one to experiment with themselves. And I think it's really healthy for, uh, if the, if parents know, or if, I, I think people need to know there are boundaries to certain things and there are mm. thresholds and, and there are many thresholds in whatever it is you're experiencing. And I passed many, 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 many thresholds. And I would hope that if and when Shalom ever did that, that she wouldn't have to go through all of those doors that we could keep <laughs> some of those doors just closed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It would be enough. It would be enough. She would get whatever thrill she needed to get, and then I would take her snowboarding, or wakeboarding, <laughs> or mountain climbing, and she'd get her yayas off that way. You know. That's awesome. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> um, it's so it's so interesting. Like I was having a chat with uh, my girlfriend like the other night, and and we were just talking about kids and stuff. We don't have kids yet, but um, and I was like my kids will never do that. <laughs> and then I'm just thinking, but Gareth, I mean, you've done far worse than that in your life. You know, you, you have to, as well, I guess, as a parent, have a bit of leniency going the other way. It's, it's, it's quite important for the kids' development. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I also grew up with parents who were not, you know, they were already married in the 60s. So they, they weren't experimenters. I mean, they, excuse me, so they miss that, you know, the, the 60s in a way, in many ways. And so I think they were, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, they were very driven and that wasn't something that came into their, their ecosystem, that didn't come into their world, you know. As my mom would read poetry or, or, or you know, they collected a lot of art and would go to a lot of galleries, I'm sure it never dawned on them that that person may have written that great poem, High on Acid. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the truth totally. is like they may have. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean. And, 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 yeah. Sorry. No go. Ahead. I was just gonna say like, and and you were probably listening to like Led Zeppelin and you know a whole bunch and the Cure you mentioned, Joy Division, and I mean, come on, there's there's, there's some of this creativity comes out of a place that's uh, uh, you know questionable yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Totally. I wish I had some of those journals that I, I uh, created back in those days. And then, and then I'm very glad I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So at a little bit of a sad uh, point of your life, I would imagine you, you, at some, at some stage, you obviously sort of came off the drugs and then unintentionally you kind of replaced the drugs with a bit of a, an abusive relationship. Um, and your partner at the time was physically abusive. Um, that must have been a really tough and traumatic time. Mm. Yeah, it was a terrible time. It's not something that you, you don't go into a relationship thinking that you'll be harmed. Mm. You know, and it was my first relationship uh, with a woman. And so I think there was also that much more weight on it, that much more expansiveness on it, that much more everything. It's kind of like I, I found something I, I really wanted to ex experience, maybe experiment with and experience. And yeah, you never walk into one of those situations thinking that you're going to walk out of it a very different person. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I did. In many ways, I did replace the pain of whatever pain I was dealing with when I was, you know, wildly into drugs with an abusive relationship that I didn't get out of the first, second, or third time that any of the um, acts of, you know, violence happened. Yeah, it's so, super, you know, gotta, yeah. gotta live with that. Yeah, it's, I think it's so tough, like, um, 
you know, you, you see people that are, that are in these sort of relationships and you're like, what are you doing? Just get out. But it's not, it's never, it's never like that. It's not easy like that at all because you, you're terrified basically. And, um, you, if you try get out, it's going to be even kind of worse. Um, so yeah, you also mentioned that like you felt like a fair bit of shame that like some, you know, somebody was hitting you like just very, very tough times. That's for sure. Yeah. It's an, it's just an emotional, mental, you know, F you up here. Mm. Yeah. That's going on. But I think for me, you know, I didn't, to be, to be really clear, I stayed because I thought I could fix her. Mm -hmm. I thought that I had something that would be a special blanket for her that would help her out of her own pain. And then eventually I stayed because I was afraid to leave because you know, she was just not, not, not well. Yeah. Uh, and then I left. And then one yeah. day I left. Wow. I, I guess as well, though, there's a, there's a point where, you know, the, the abusive side of a relationship is only a percentage and there's a lot of other good in the relationship. And, and I guess it's easy when you love someone that, like you say, you can either fix or you can also be like, well, you know what? It's, there's so much good in the relationship too. I mean, I would imagine. And it's, no. it's <laughs> not that one. <laughs> not that one. Early on. No, oh, we passed the wow. good. We That's passed the good early it. on. Um, yeah, it was, it was also, you know, I, so we've, we've talked about now a few things that have made me who I am. Um, dyslexia, being athletic. Uh, experimenting with drugs and kind of, you know, wanting to break on through to the other side in many ways, uh, the death of friends and being in an abusive relationship. And every single thing that I just mentioned to you has allowed me to relate and be with people as they are, every single thing. Uh, and so would I take away the pain that I felt? Yeah, sure. I don't, I didn't need we need to feel all of that pain. Mm. However, mm. I wouldn't be sitting here had I not gone there. And I, I actually wouldn't be me. I don't, I think I would be a more selfish version of me. I think I would be mm. a more, I don't, I would not be, well, I just wouldn't have the same heart, I don't think. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I guess it. I guess it adds to like layers to you, especially now with what you do. Your, your job is just all about people, um, and that compassion and that empathy. You have like a higher level of it than most people because of what you've been through. Hey, well, I think because because of that, and I think what I chose to do with all of that pain. Mm, yeah, yeah, true. Was to point. figure out why I was made up that way. Why I why you know um and that took a lot of my 20s to figure out yeah why i decided to go down those roads and what did that mean and where where do i go from there so i wouldn't mm. carry shame forever you know sure mm. yeah we... i think in understanding you know in buddhism i mean you understand that there's a lot of there's suffering in life and that is part of life and once you can accept that well then you're free mm. just like i believe the more that you love that you really truly unconditionally love and open your heart to just love it liberates you i do think it sets you free love in the right way i don't mean love because i want i i chose i chose to stay in that relationship that was codependency mm. that's not love mm. no that wasn't love but love in terms of Love without expectation, mm. you know, just because you can. Yeah. Like yeah. Very liberating about that. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. I, I love what you said there, like, you know, about Buddha, like, su like suffering is part of life. Like, and like you said, as soon as you can accept that, then it's like, okay, cool. I can, you can maybe understand why things happen to you. You can deal with those tougher moments better and then move on from them quicker as well. Um, which is, yeah. yeah. Well, and not only that, then you can lend a hand to someone who's going through that. And for me, I think that's what is extremely important to me that I, I can do something with all of the experiences that I can be of service, that I can 
just hold that person wherever they are. Mm. That to me is the, that's the gift of it all. Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful indeed. And talking about like healing and these sort of things, like after your relationship, you started doing a lot of inner work and, and looking like inside yourself and stuff. And there's actually a really cool story. I think, you were working um, in a grocery supermarket in San Fran and there was like a, a customer, he was a re- repeat customer and he came in and I don't know, he, there was a cool story around it. He said something to you and then he got you involved in yeah. some sort of program. Yeah, his name was Mark. He was a massage therapist and just a wonderful soul. And he said to me one day, maybe after two years of knowing me, hmm. he looked at me and he said, you can see, can't you? <laughs> yeah and then he took me to Sausalito over the Golden Gate Bridge to a a school called the um, the Institute of Intuitive Studies <laughs> and I went to whatever the class was an introduction class or whatever on um, on clairvoyancy oh cool wow. and I ended up staying there for and studying there every what was it like every Thursday night or every Tuesday, Thursday night for many years, about four years, learning to, to read chakras, heal chakras, you know, be able to do that in other people and clairvoyancy and, you know, what to do with when you tap into some serious intuition. And then we did some past life regressions and wow. all of that stuff, which I just think is really cool because I, I think it's real. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent. That's all I can say. I don't even have like a profound statement to say or sentence. I just believe intuition is real, and intuition is what guides me. And and I am blessed that I can listen to my gut and my head and my heart. Mm. Yeah. Do you think we should be cultivating that, all of us? Yes, I do. I do because I think it's something that we all have access to. Every single one of us, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't know how the brain works, but I do believe that every single one of us has two things. One, a pilot light inside of us. So our own internal flame. Mm -hmm. Our own internal flame that only we can ignite or dim. Only we can do that. And I also absolutely believe that every single one of us has access to our own intuition. It depends on if we are open to it or if we cloud it, you know, if we, if we decide to cover it up in blankets of fog, or if we say, Oh, I'm going to experience this. I'm going to check this out. What is it like when I actually listen to myself? Mm. I'll go down that road. You could start with something easy. Like it doesn't have to be a big relationship or, you know, should I, it could even be, it could even be like, should I take a left turn? Should I take a right turn? But you know what's fascinating about that is, and you, you, you mentioned it earlier, is when you go inside yourself, you actually start to connect with that more, I think, because so many people live, you know, from without. Everything is outside in. And like you said, it actually your journey started with your pilot light, which I really, I like that sort of, that, that visualization of that because it's, that's where everything actually starts from healing and energy and wherever, whatever else in your life. And so if you can connect with that, which means not worrying about external circumstances, then you can actually start to understand that intuition. But I think so many people are so disconnected with anything when there's silence and just yourself that they never actually get to experience that sort of feeling of intuition. Yes. I believe that many people are walking around with enormous amounts of fear and pain and it's hard to tap in anywhere if you are that weighed down i believe especially if you're walking around with fear and pain the last thing you want someone to do is come up to you and be like just listen to your light man (laughs) just tune in man it's true no that person wants you to be commiserate with them and find the misery in it and be like yeah Mm. you're right life sucks, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so what, what advice do you, or, or what 
you know, what would you encourage someone in that sort of state to do? In that sad state? Yeah, in that sad state. You can go get some help or talk to someone. Like, talk to a professional. Go to some kind of, like, group therapy. Um, go meditate. Go get, find the truth. Find whatever the truth is. And the truth may be, yeah, it sucked. You were in an abusive relationship and that sucks and it does a number of to who you are, a number. However, that's not who you are. That's mm -hmm. what happened to you. It's not oh. who you are. You are not some, you know, you're not meant to be battered and bruised and kicked around all day. You're a child of this universe. Like that's who you are. And so finding people that can acknowledge that about you and help you see your good, your light, I think is an incredible place to start. And if that is a therapist or a counselor, cool. That's a teacher, great. That's a sports coach, terrific. If that's a, a group therapy where you're all there together, but you're trying to elevate the you know collective consciousness, awesome. That's a mm. mountaintop in Nepal, cool. <laughs> you know? it. What it won't be is it's not at the bottom of a whiskey bottle. Yes. That's for sure. That's super yeah. cool. And you know what it takes, whiskey. like you say, it takes someone that has often been through those situations themselves to see that in someone else. And, and Gareth and I have been speaking a lot about compassion and empathy and, you know, what do these words mean and, and, and how do you use them? Like, cause you, you kind of want to be able to see that within someone else and, and, and have a feeling of like compassion if, if that's the right word. And then, but still see that you can come out of it and it's okay. And, 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 to, to find that sort of middle ground is so important. And that's why it's so great to have someone like yourself that has actually been down some of those roads because you actually totally get it. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I've sat in those meetings. You know, I've been that person. I've gone into those group meetings. And then I'm like, oh, wow, I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. huh. That's cool. If I'm not the only one. There's others like me. Wow going to get out of this yeah, yeah that's, that's why it's so important to share our stories hey it's so important that's why i i that's why i love being on this podcast because you said it's all about storytelling exactly <laughs> so at this stage you were um you know we're talking about your your work and things like that so maybe um you can tell us a little bit uh, more about your work at the time and uh, the industry you in involved in you were you held some senior leadership positions for, for, for various companies in San Fran and in London. Yeah. So um, I found my way into the world of digital in 1998 in San Francisco, where, where the dot-com boom, the first one, was happening. I, had, I really had no, I didn't know what I was going to do. Honestly, I thought I was going to be a therapist. <laughs> and I, this opportunity landed on my lap, and so I went with it. And I'm really happy I did because, you know, that means I'm somewhat of a digital native, even at my age. I mean, I am really, you know. And that path, and working with the people in those in those days who were, you know, early entrepreneurs, led me to understand advertising and communication and marketing and I never had gone to school for it so I really got kind of my own again experiential education with it and was able to learn by feeling you know learn by doing which is really important to me and one thing led to another and I, I should say after the um after 9-11 there was the dot-com bust mm. and in 2002 I had uh, gotten laid off which most of us did in San Francisco, Silicon Valley area. And I started an outdoor adventure company, surfing company, rock climbing company. And I did that for almost five years, which uh -huh. was really, really cool. And so I got back to doing what it is I love, which is being in the outdoors, being athletic, coaching people on, you know, feeling really empowered in my body, uh, which was killer. I mean, writing content for a website and, and getting people to like show up at the beach to learn how to surf was pretty awesome. <laughs> we sold that in 2005. It still is in existence, actually. 
Um, and then I went back to this world of wide world of marketing and communications and one thing led to another and I, I eventually got an incredible opportunity to move to London, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of 2009 when actually the market was crashing. And I was extremely humbled and extremely excited that I had an opportunity to kind of almost like restart, reboot in many ways. I was 39 going on 40 and moved to London without knowing anyone, without knowing mm -hmm. anyone at, at the agency and, hmm. you know, really had just the most incredible time. It was really empowering. It was a great way to get to know myself in a different way. It was very quiet. I would ride the double decker buses, and sit up in the front and just listen to my headphones on and on and on. <laughs> and then I, you know, met some great people off some great friends out there. And, and it was around, you know, so I've been in agencies for a while and I, and I really understand what it's like to work your butt off, work in a team, work in the trenches, you know, work with tight deadlines, work when the client is upset work when the client is elated and all, all the while, while I was doing that I would say from 2009 until 2013 there was that voice in my head and it started to get very 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 loud which was saying like I don't really want to do advertising anymore I really just want to work with people and when I eventually met Gary and he moved me here in May of 2014 I, I took the role of doing what it was I had already always done, you know, running big accounts, being a strategist. But that voice then got really loud. <laughs> and that's when I told him in May of 2015, like, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, but I think I'm good, I'm done. Like, I'm not interested in the selling of anything anymore. I really only care about people. I really, I just, I just care about having these conversations and holding space and coaching and being a Sherpa and being able to really let that person know it's okay. Like I got you. Mm. Okay. While you're mm. here and while I see you, like I got you, it's going to be okay. You know, I can't save anyone, but I can certainly send in a life raft or a lifeline. Mm. And, and that's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's really, really cool. Um, I have like this real sort of, um, I get this real sense of courageousness from you, like in, in everything that you do, you know, like you're willing to try new things and, you know, coming to London when you're 39 and not knowing anyone. Um, also then, you know, before that starting your own business, like these are all very daunting things to do. And, you know, you obviously that fire inside of you, that pilot light is, is very, is very strong. <laughs> not such a little one. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, you got to be courageous when, I think you, you have to be courageous when you're learning how to learn. Like it, you have to be courageous. Like when you, when you try drugs, you're courageous. You're not just stupid. You're also mm -hmm. like, when you, you know, are rock climbing and running out of the Grand Canyon and putting crampons on, like you're courageous. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the stupid things I did are full of courage. They weren't full of fear. You know, and so I, so courage is a part of me. It's a big, big, big part of me. And, and I think I'm, I'm very humbled that I can marry courage and vulnerability in a way mm. that is very seamless for me. And it just is, it's not a, oh my God, I need to really be vulnerable right now. You know, it's just, it just is. And that's the world that I want to live in. Yeah. Yeah, and naturally, that's important. Um, so, so just the what? What was that bus number that you used to sit on in London? Um, everyone remembers their bus number. All right, seventy-three. Okay, uh, so, so let me guess, seventy-three. I'm trying to think. Like, uh, I don't remember that number actually. Where was that in London? So I pick it up around um, uh, Oxford Street, Baker. Uh, okay. So um, I'm sorry, Mar Marble, Marble Arch, and it would take you all the way to the east. Mm -hmm. And then the 10, I think the 10 maybe was like by Hyde Park. Yes, I know the 10. The, the, 10, uh, the 10's got a long route as well. Yeah, the longer, the longer the better. 
Uh, so, you know, I had friends that lived outside of the city, so I would take the, the Southeastern train or you know, all, that, all that great stuff. And I would just put on block party and just, you know, <laughs> music is my, like music is my thing. Music is what always has spoken to me mm. in, the, in the darkest of times and the best of times. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the eighties. So I listened to like, the cure. I listened to, um, uh, Depeche. I listened to Depeche the Mode. Yeah. It's a base. Order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So psychedelic furs and 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 echo and the bunny man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh there's such good. There's some really good bands there, but yeah, the Pesh Mode was right up there. And but yeah, like so many good ones. My sister actually watched the Cure. They were in South Africa for like I think maybe the first time recently, and she sent me these like clips and like it was just she was blo- like had listened to it her, her, her whole life and she was just so happy to have listened to the cure <laughs> oh there's something amazing about seeing them live it's the best yeah, yeah it's the best so but yeah we were talking about courage and I, and i am grateful that everything i've done has led me to become more and more courageous in life and being a child at my age you know i didn't have a child but being a mom at my age a brand new mom is hella courageous yeah you know and and exciting and the best thing that's ever happened that's so cool exciting how are you uh how's it like fitting into your daily routine and stuff now it must be quite a shift in it yeah it's quite a shift in it and also i mean that's why i think i'm much more religious about the time i have because i want to get home for you know dinner and bath whereas like it didn't matter if i was home at eight you know to be home at yeah. eight that's fine but now i want to be home you know no later than six and and so that's really a trip it's good it's really really good i learn things every single day i'm just like i'm flattened meaning like mm. i'm I'm, I'm building me now. Yes. I'm building me again. And I can see that happening because I know nothing, no, absolutely mm. nothing other than just to love this creature and to pick her up when she's crying and to, you know, laugh when she laughs and all of that oh, stuff. That's super cool. Wow. It's so amazing. And, and it's also, it's also, I guess, like it's adding that other layer to you now in, in terms of understanding, you know, so, the people that, you know, you, well, I would say work for you, but you say uh, you work for, um, they, uh, now you understand that maybe the parents or, or you will start beginning to understand those, them better and, and add that layer of sort of compassion and stuff to them as well. Yeah. Big time, big time. I don't think it's easy. Mm. I don't think parenting is easy and I don't think it's easy when, life and work have merged in the way that they have and Mm. you need to make choices life is different and potentially or possibly i should say slower years ago when they weren't all going home and getting on our laptops or going home and looking at our phones yeah Mm. so you have to make choices now and choice can be really uh, the most empowering thing and choice could be also the most daunting and scary thing yeah, totally. And, and, and talking about like choice and daunting and scary and, and courage and all these things um, and like convergence and things happening, it was, and you've touched on it already, but like it was 2013 and, and your best friend, Gail, mm-hmm. she dropped you an email and she introduced you to this man <laughs> and you guys had that form in a conversation. And next thing you know, like you're on a flight a month later to New York and within five minutes, you guys, I think by the sounds of it are hugging it out and basically, you know, have fallen in love with each other as business partners. And, and that was it. So you, you, you signed the contract with Gary Vaynerchuk. So, you know, it sounds like it was meant to be. It was absolutely meant to be. It was really meant to be. And I never would have known until that minute that I met him at the coffee shop in New York, that it was meant to be until I actually could feel the vibe it's one thing on the phone and anyone would fall in love with him you know he's so charismatic and he's just so smart 
but that minute it was just very chill and it was as though I was talking to my brother and that's really how I think about it I mean he's my boss mm. but he's also my brother and my friend and my mentor and oh, it's awesome <laughs> that's so cool he seems to certainly come across in that way like obviously we are, you know people that follow him get a certain slant of him but he just seems like a very straight like caring very very caring person but also says it as it is and i guess that's kind of like a brotherly figure in some ways you know i think that's absolutely i think you're spot on i think that's absolutely true he i think because he says it as it is there's a calm about it whereas mm. and it could be a little bit jarring to some people but i think there's something very calming about getting the truth and being around mm. someone that's just so he's just this is the way it is yeah it's it's so it's so weird like i i i, I connect to, i mean i've never met i've met i've met him but just like at one of his events but like i feel there's some connection there because he, what he says is just so powerful and um like it's that truthfulness like you said um and I always find myself like defending him <laughs> online against other people or friends. If I share like a video and they'll be like, Oh no, look at him. He's brash and mm. says all these things. I'm like, no, no, no. You've got to really understand this guy. Like, you know, he's probably the only one of the only people in the world that is, is saying the truth and, and the honesty and it might not be what you want to hear, but, but you've got to really admire him for that authenticity and that honesty. It's such an important part in, in, for everyone to, to, to do, you know? Yeah. And actually, you know, you said something like it might not be what you want to hear. The fact is, is like everyone wants to hear the truth. I think it's the delivery that people might not want to hear. Mm. If you think about it, because he's saying most of the time, what I think we all are thinking somewhere, <laughs> it's the delivery. It's the delivery of how he actually says it that i think is what can jar people if you know if they're jarable <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that but he, you know that that's him and he's unabashedly gary and i think that's that authenticity wins out in the end of the day where you kind of just go he's not being a dick he's he's just literally this is how he is and and then you then it's less jarring i'd imagine just because you understand this is just the guy you know yeah but that's his secret sauce. I mean, that's like everyone's got their special, their special stuff, right? Everyone. Mm. And he, his special thing is like, he says it how it is. He cares deeply. He's a super empath. And he says it how it is and, and, and doesn't apologize for doing so. Mm. Mm. That's really wonderful. Yeah. And, and uh, Claude, you, you mentioned a little, briefly earlier, you actually, ended up leaving uh, Vayna once before and, and it was a tough decision but now you're back with a, a title of chief heart officer and uh, yeah maybe you could tell us a little bit about your role there and yeah that awesome title yeah totally so I, I did leave and then four months later Gary and I met up for breakfast and and that was that we just said you know hey you're coming back and you're gonna be chief heart officer and as I've said before like yeah got it cool uh, wasn't a, it wasn't going to, it wasn't a like, oh no, 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 I cannot be a computer scientist. It was that, <laughs> that. Um, and the role is to scale Gary. Like that is the number one role <laughs> that was created to scale him. And I've been very honored to be given all of the autonomy needed to do that. The, you know, Gary is a person that is extremely magnanimous. And as we said, I mean, he's, He's a magnet. And so I could never fill his shoes. It's the way I do what I do is something that he trusts implicitly and felt as though the agency really needed that, you know, needed someone such as myself to, to scale him and to infuse compassion and empathy and tenderness and tough love and, you know, radical candor and, mm. and an ear and, and I was, and that's me. And so, you know, my day is spent doing that in a multitude of ways, you know, whether or not that's one-on-ones in this room or responding to people that want to chat, having one-on-ones with C-suite 
players and, and you know, thinking through strategies, people strategies, performance plans, um, you know, dealing with some pretty high level stuff, the expansions into other countries and how we're going to do that. And, and also just like what my take is on like the, the, the heartbeat of the agency, like what is my take on this? And I don't have to necessarily be in London to be able to feel London. And that's something that I'm really, I'm really excited about that. That's, that's a strength of mine. Mm. Again, like, please don't ask me to do any kind of front end coding because I can't, you know, I'm not <laughs> able, I'm not able to do that as well. Let's just say, <laughs> however, you know, I, I'm able to feel, and that's scaling him, you know, feeling and then acting mm. and being in like serious partnership with him. That's, that's the person that I'm in partnership. I work for all of these people. I'm in partnership with him. Mm. I love, I love that. Like how you guys say you work for the people. It's, it's mm. so powerful. Like, um, I used to be an investment banker and, um, I, I remember I used to like, we used to sit in these, you know, big auditoriums and used to have like the CEOs and CEOs give you the talks and the updates and whatnot. And, and, like I used to sit there every year and, and they would go, the most important thing in our business is the clients. And every time I'd sit there and I'd go, but surely, you know, we are also pretty important, the guys that work here. And, and it just showed like, you know, if, if that's from the top down, that it just doesn't work. No one was necessarily that happy. They didn't want to necessarily go the extra mile. And especially these days in finance where there's, no real massive incentives like they used to be. Um, you really have to invest in your people if you want a successful business. It, it seems so obvious, but businesses don't do it. Yeah, it seems so obvious, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that Maybe. there are certain businesses that are, are run for, for bottom top line growth, and that's really it. And there are certain businesses that just exist to just be fearful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then there are certain businesses that want to change the world and those are the businesses and those are the leaders i want to be with mm -hmm. we are in, we're in a market we're a marketing advertising creative agency i mean call it what you want you know we're a digital agency for the now it doesn't it doesn't matter but the fact that we are obsessed with how we treat human beings is what is going to make us win. Because if you come from that place, and think about the creativity that can spring forward that way. You know, you're not worried about your job. You're not worried about your job. What you want to do is you want to have the flexibility and the runway to create the most, you know, excellent, gorgeous, elegant, funny, whatever it is, piece of art, if you will, video, that is going to touch lives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's amazing as well for the back of what you both been saying there is that in, in doing what you're doing and, and creating this human environment, this caring, you know, uh, loving environment, you're also being watched by so many people and, you know, the super successful company has that as its core other people are going to be like, you know, we, sh you know, it's a great example in other words. And, and I think that's also really cool. It's not just, it's, it rubs off, let's say on other companies seeing that, that this is now actually people, this is the way forward. And this is how we create good long-term healthy companies. And I think, you know, that's, that's definitely something that we super, in, you know, inspired to see. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the wave, you know, we're on the wave. Mm. It does take quite a while for waves to build, as my South African friends know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a surfer, you've got to look way in the back to see where the swell's coming from. But eventually, yeah. it will come. Mm. And this revolution that's happening here, where we're putting human beings back into the workplace and bringing humanity back and tenderness back and giving a you know what about the people who are actually creating what it is you sell mm. that revolution is happening and it's just going to take a while and so you know, 
play the long game. <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. We'll get there because everything else will, I, do, I truly believe that the way millennials are going and the way Gen Z is going and the generations that are going to come are not going to stand for this other kind of antiquated, you know, top line, bottom line, roar. They, they want to work with purpose and passion and they want to be respected as human beings, not as cogs in the wheel. You know, they want to be seen as having heartbeats. That's, that's my, that's my POV. You know, that's, it's one woman's opinion. Yeah, totally. but but I mean, I feel like this is that's actually what it's really always been, hasn't it? But yeah. it maybe hasn't been an option. But now we, I don't know, maybe the the later generations are a bit more outspoken. There's a bit bit more connection. We can talk about things easier, and it's sort of filtering into you know definitely what you're doing now. But those generations for sure. And I yeah. guess you can't cover stuff up as well, I guess, like, you know, like yeah. in the past, you have the closed door and that would be it. Now everything is so connected and open. Like if you're treating people badly, like that's going to come out, it becomes exposed. It does become exposed. And I think, you know, we have to be honest now that there's such a push and an emphasis on you know, bringing humanity back to the workplace. And also there's also the Me Too movement. There's also the, you know, well, how much humanity is humanity? I mean, can I just like, you know, be my crazy self? And like, no, you can't. Yes. Happy medium. What, that's what it's all about. And so there's a lot of work. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. I don't, as much as I think like, yes, we should be able to snap our fingers and, and treat employees as humans rather than cogs in the wheel like yes i i actually think that should have happened yesterday there's also some training that we need to do to remind ourselves of what what human is what is it to be a human yeah you know, what is it to be a human with emotions with a family with issues with you know glory with celebrations with pain in their lives like because yes work we come here and we work all you know that's what we do however we do have lives and those lives affect who we are here and so let's like make sure we're looking at the holistic human being and the holistic that holistic person i mean can you imagine if i came to work every day and did not acknowledge the fact that i have a daughter yeah an enormous part of my heart would just be closed mm. And so we have to acknowledge that in human beings and what that's like or acknowledging the fact that you know someone hasn't seen their parents in three years because they live in thailand or someone's father is ill or someone just got engaged this past weekend i mean they're going to come you know you gotta, you gotta like if we go back to what we've been talking about in this entire podcast which is the ability to feel the ability to courageously step out and be able to be there for other people. Like that's what it's about. It is acknowledging that, Oh shit, if shit. If this happens to me, imagine what it happens to 800 people. Mm. You know, if I'm a human being and I, I go through some of the trials and tribulations and celebrations and joys like, Oh, well, I guess that's happening for everyone else. Yeah. Why don't I open myself to that? You're speaking our language. Yeah, well, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> I love it. Exactly, exactly. Um, it's it's interesting that exactly what you just said because I was just going to say we actually have um, a couple of questions from uh, Michael O'Brien and then another guy. I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, if you've heard of him, uh, uh, Michael Bungay Stania. Um, he wrote the Coaching Habits. Um, he's that both both of them. Both of them have been a guest on our podcast. I was like, you know, it's good to always just have a couple of questions and they're in your space. Um, so uh, th their question was actually, th they asked two, but the first one was actually very, very similar. And they, they say, how do you encourage others to step out of Gary Vee's long shadow and to be themselves as he's such a strong character and I imagine a strong influence on the culture too? Mm. So we don't expect anyone to be Gary at all, not one bit. 
And so in creating a culture of belonging and in creating a place where people can feel safe to be whomever it is they are, that means they come into work as Johnny and Sarah and Susie. They don't come in as Gary. Like, let's be honest. Gary is a rare, rare, rare bird. <laughs> and for any of us to become Gary, well, we need to start yesterday. But, you know, but, you know, Gary is, Gary is Gary. Let's let Gary be Gary. Let's let Johnny be Johnny. Mm. I want Bobby to be Bobby. Like, that's the thing. And so there is never a moment in time where we, well, certainly never expect it. We don't, we don't want that. We're not hiring for Gary's. I think that's the other thing. And so when I'm meeting people and talking to people that, and this actually hasn't happened in about two years, 18 months, I would say, where people would come into my room with anxiety and saying, like, I got to hustle like Gary. I got to hustle like that. Yeah, yeah. You hustle like Johnny. You hustle like Claude. You hustle like Alex. Gary has chosen to hustle for 18 hours a day. That's Gary. Mm -hmm. So how do I encourage it? It's, it's, we encourage it in such a way to create a really accepting and fertile, fertile environment here for people to be whomever they want to be. Um, but it's, it's just not Gary. You know, there's not a lot of propaganda around. That's great. And, and I've just, just off, I guess off the back of the question got me thinking like, you know, not, I, I, like the, I think a lot of, most of this credit probably has to go to you because you're the one who is really helping shape this culture and stuff. So is that how it works? Do you go like, Gary, look here, buddy, um, this is what we're going to be doing um, because you know that it ties in with, with his values and his way of seeing the world? Yeah, I mean, to an extent, to an extent. I, I think Gary doesn't want anyone to be Gary. <laughs> and we just want to accept people as they are. So yes, if that's, if that's me, you know, creating and cultivating the culture with them, yes, it's, it's really reminding people or, or introducing the thought to people that just, you are accepted just the way you are as long as you're not an a-hole, mm. you want to come in and you want to bring it and you want to learn and you want to grow and you want to create, we want you here. And especially if you are a kind human being, we really want you, <laughs> you know? So that's super cool. And I, and I was just wondering like, um, as well. So, so you, you hear Gary, like he talks about so many different things, you know, patience, humility, empathy, um, does he get that say from you? Like you'll be like in a meeting and you go, Gary, this is, you know, you'll just be talking about it. Has that, has a lot of that stemmed from your guys relationship of working together? No, that hasn't stemmed from it. He's, that is his language. But what has stemmed from it is we now have an incredible shorthand mm. because I speak the same language. So it's very quick for us to make calls, decisions, have a conversation. You know, I had, uh, he's on the way to the airport and I had, I was able to have, you know, seven minute conversation with him today. And it was very quick, you know, because we already are speaking on that, on that, mm. you know, we speak that language, whether or not you want to call it a vibration or a frequency. Mm. It's just the way it is. It's, I think what I've learned with Gary is I need, to, for me, I need to be a straight shooter. Mm. And, uh, and that's the work I need to continuously do, which is make sure I am just giving him the data, the information, and then we can make decisions based on mm. that. Cool. And, and do you feel pressure? Like, do you feel pressured working with someone like that, that is hustling so hard and, and is so switched on? Do you feel like, wow, this is sometimes I've just got to give him the right info and don't mess it up, you know? No, never, ever, 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 ever. What I love about Gary is 96% of the time I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him the, I'm going to tell him what's up and 4% of the time he's going to push back. 96% mm. of the time it's exactly where he is. That's and so cool. the pushback is great because that's also where the learning is. Mm. That's incredible. 
you know, or if he challenges me on a thought, you know, it's never, it's not challenging me with malice. I'll just say, why do you think that? Or I disagree and yeah. this is what it is, or actually, you know, whatever. So it's, it's the most unique relationship I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, and it's one that I'll have forever because, because that's just, that's just how it will be. Mm. That's, that, that. To, to have that type of relationship and that type of autonomy where I can give him information 100% of the time and knowing like that's what he wants. He wants me to have the freedom to, to feel this place. I mm. want to make this the greatest place in the world, like, but forever. Mm. That's really, really cool. And you know what is, is like the best thing or like from my point of view, at least is that when when your employees who you work for, I just like to get that right all the time, but when they see you guys getting on so well and they see that connection, like that is properly powerful and that really filters down and encourages and gives uh, the staff permission to do the same. Well, yeah. And you want to know the funniest thing is it's very rare that people will see us together. Okay. Mm. That's the funniest thing. Because what he and I are talking about are very, you know, obviously pretty, you know, they're much more behind closed door conversations. Yeah. And so the leadership team will see us together. You know, it's very rare. We don't sit on the same sides of the office, which is great. Uh, and so what our, our communication is, either in, in, you know, behind closed doors, on the phone, text message. Um, however, and he's very, he's incredibly vocal and, and amazing in the public when he talks about me and the role. And, and I, you know, I, I recognize that. But I think people can pick up on the fact, like, why would you have, like, why would this CEO, this, this big presence have a role like this if he didn't want it? Mm. Mm. that's the deal and so when he says like look this is god has the seat at the table next to me is an enormous 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 honor and i, I do think people pay attention to that it's not something that i say out loud often mm. um because I'm, I'm filled with uh, humility around it but it is it's an incredible incredible place to be Mm, that's for sure totally understand that yeah and uh yeah you know, we've only we've only got like a just less than 10 minutes left with you i just wanted to just cut a few more questions so um what would you uh tell a younger claude silver with what you know now oh man this this question i'm gonna just steal this sorry guys i'm um, about to run out of power uh, no worries no worries Oh, the younger Claude Silver needs to just be confident and just to be like super, super comfortable in her own skin with the way she learns and the way she experiences the world. You know, I mean, I couldn't change if I wanted to, I wouldn't have been able to change. It's just not how I'm, again, back to being organized. I'm not, you know, I'm not meant to be a mathematician or an Excel spreadsheet whiz. But I think I probably, could have spoken up a lot in my early days when I chose not to for whatever reasons, you know. So be confident, take up space, you know, when be big. Mm. Be big. Love it. Get yeah. that inner light. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the inner light is there. So why not shine it? Yeah. Like, why not shine it and share it? Yeah. That's so cool. the killer thing. Like, why not shine and share That's... your light? Who's it gonna hurt if it comes from that place of like love and yeah. goodness. Mm. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's a freaking yeah. tweetable, tweetable link right there. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Let's go, people. What are we do? Honestly, yeah. what are we doing here? Like, you've got a t shirt on in a podcast that's called Ridiculously Human because we are ridiculously human. And you're doing something about it, you're in action about it. Like, let's go. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> and what, what what are you excited about right now in the world um what am i excited about right now in the world i'm excited about this i'm excited about this message i'm excited about 
more people getting moving out of being stuck and out of fear into like working for others like that's that's it if we could get everyone working for each other eventually someone's going to work for you someone's going to work for me mm. this is what i'm excited about this thought we wake up in the morning every single morning and how many people do we know that are actually have our backs all day so many people mm. so many people that we don't even think about want us to go out and just have the best day of our entire life and we don't even think about it our parents mm -hmm. our family our kids even your dog you know but i mean <laughs> to be totally serious like everyone that you've come encountered come encountered with and have and have touched in your life they only want you to continue doing that they only want you to continue riding in that wave that's what i'm stoked about so let's like let's turn that off <laughs> you know, like, that's deep and i get it and that's super deep but like you you know both of you are waking up in the morning with the promise that someone that you know and love is going to go out there and just get it yeah. i mean like i'm gripping my hand tight just get it people are thinking that of you and of me and of alex and of everyone so like if we could just like get into that place you know, look, you asked me what I'm hot on right now. That's what I'm hot on. <laughs> I love it. It's, that's a great visualization to have in the morning. It's like, let's just remember that every day of our lives. And what the world would be such a good place, wouldn't it? Because you just, you're like, you, it's a self-limiting beliefs we have sometimes, isn't it? And, but other people are, are so stoked for us. And it's, I love that. I really, really going to try and remember that one. And, and what have you got lined up for the future yourself and, and, <laughs> Uh, where can people contact you? Oh. Yeah, um, well, I'll be in London next week and then uh, be in Park City in a couple weeks speaking. I'm really stoked, Park City, Utah. Uh, so I'm speaking a lot. You know, I, I, I try to try to make the rounds there and share as much of the, the story about the revolution. <laughs> uh, people can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram, Twitter. And I respond to everyone. It might take me a little bit of time, but... I really appreciate people's thoughts and notes and, and, you know, I, I certainly uh, am a party of one. So it takes a village to change, change the world. Mm. So like, as I said already, like, let's go, let's yeah. go. Yes. We, love that. Go. <laughs> we want to be part of that village. <laughs> right. Thank you for having me. So, so just the last question, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I kind of just alluded to it, didn't it? Being, being ridiculously human is like being completely who you are, flawed and warts, celebratory, good looking, whatever, like just laying it out there and being okay with it. Like, let's like have a laugh with it, mm. you know, have a laugh, be serious. Like find that, find that balance of, of being okay, understanding that there is suffering in this world, but not letting it get you down, using that as a springboard to do something. So ridiculously human is just like, here I am. I, look, we started it with this quote, I'm gonna end with this quote. Like, <laughs> here I am, rock me like a hurricane. Ooh. <laughs> That's it, here That's I am, rock me like a hurricane. Let's, let's, let's make some waves, man. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that's well, so cool. Just from my side, uh, Claude, just thank you so much for your incredible energy. You know, you, you said earlier you can you have you can feel London, you can feel around the world, you've got this ability and and I think it works the other way too. We can feel your amazing amazing energy too. So so thank for, thank you so much for being so honest and open and and building this village of people because it's super important. We have each other's backs if we only allow it. And I think that's uh, such a great message. And we really appreciate your time here today. So just uh, have an epic day. Uh, yeah, Rocky like a hurricane. What a great <laughs> message. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Craig. I really appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much. That's so cool. And then just, just briefly for me, I just wanted to say thank you for your vulnerability. You know, that, that, that's, that's such an important thing uh, these days. I think 
people must see their vulnerability as a, as a superpower um, because it allows people to then have conversation and it, allow, it gives other people permission to do the same and to realize that we're all in the boat, in this boat together, you know, and we, we all have to um, be open and honest and communicate about whatever is going on to make it a better place. And it was just really, really cool. Like Craig said, you have this amazing energy, you've got such a great smile and I can only imagine it must be super cool uh, working for you and learning from you. I mean, you speak so wisely. You, you've, you've had so many things that have happened to you in your life and that all adds these layers of wisdom onto us as people. And, and you've definitely traversed a, a massive range of different things and, and emotions and stuff. And it's, uh, it's just really, really cool. So, so thanks again for coming on our podcast. It's a serious privilege and uh, just want to wish you an amazing rest of the day. Thank you guys. I'm really honored. I loved it. I appreciated going deep and, and you know, I'm here, so I know we'll, we'll cross paths again. Yes. Cool. Okay. Thank you Brilliant. so much. Thanks, Thanks so much. For... Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change.